So it is integral and natural part of it. I'm your brother. I worked for Lux for more than five years, and there I'm kind of quality guy, uh, where I make sure that uh, everything we create has this quality deeply baking. And in my presentation, I focus on multiple tools that we use. Uh, and we think they help us to keep this quality in the world. First of all, you could ask, what is quality then? There are some simple answers, so just meeting requirements, conforming to design, just being good for the use, and there are more advanced definitions. Does it bring value? Is it more fair product? But on the other hand, those more advanced quality definitions are really not precise. They are not telling you what to do. They are not highlighting any path. They are very rude. Look, you can do anything just, just to meet with those. And I know you most probably are just Java developers, JVM developers. And you didn't come here just to hear about those things. Today, I'll try to focus on something that I think is much more interesting and much more important. And I'll call it ultimate division. So this is kind of quality that I think is really the most important one. So I lose microphone. Is it enabled? Can you hear me? No, sir. No. Okay, I need to just press button. So when I have a mic, I will repeat. Today we won't be talking about those blurred quality things, we'll be talking about this one concrete elite. So whenever you start a new project, Greenfield, usually go to conference like Geekon, DevOx, CoreDump, and you hear about KISS, SOLID, TDD, BDD, those fancy acronyms. And you try to incorporate them into the project, yeah? Because this is cool, fancy stuff, this brings you quality, so let's do it. You read books microservices, code simplicity, functional programming. However, you need to be careful because the difference between O'Reilly and Orly publishing houses is very tiny. So be very careful when choosing what books to read. And whenever you try to implement those stuff that you heard on conferences, that you've read in books, you may become really busy. Right? Because there's a lot of stuff. Those things are time consuming, they are hard to do. And you see that you may reject some simpler solutions, saying, okay, I don't have time for it. And it may happen that whenever you don't have time, you are too busy, you may perform some, some tiny, tiny uh, mistakes, uh, some small bugs, some typos, some money savings. And in uh, there is theory that is called broken window theory, right? And this theory says that whenever there is a street and there is some litter, there is a broken window, there is some graffiti on the walls, 
those are not really serious things. But such environment may lead to even very violent crime, murders, rapes, things like that. So by being just a little bit too busy and cutting corners, doing hugs, some duplication, innocent duplication, you create an environment where those small things are kind of allowable. So if small thing is good, if no, no, no one like punishes you for duplication that you do, you have a feeling that this is all right and it may become worse and worse, especially if you don't have enough time. So when the time passes, what may happen is you go into the second phase of using acronyms. But then there are others like SDD, spaghetti driven design. There is control C, control V, duplication, WTH, WTF. Also, FUBAR, TARFU, SNAFU, which means totally and royally freaked up. Situation normal, all filled up. So I met it a couple of times as the comments in the code. So from those push projects, I learned those acronyms. And it means that this elite is really low at this place. About 80% of software projects is considered as not successful, whatever it means. Th those are the services that are performed. So the situation compared to Krakow would be like that. So if, if the same was in the building industry, from the roof of Hotel Galaxy, you would observe this kind of panorama. It's, it's uh, six skeletons. Yeah, all not finished, and only one Buenkitek that, that is standing, but everything is failed. And indeed, productivity can reach zero whenever we spend time fixing the stuff that should never be broken. So we need to make sure that this level of things that that shouldn't be broken, should be sh those windows that are broke is not too high. There is first law of programming. If you type it in Google, you'll find this definition. This is the most important uh, law that is observed. That if you lower the quality, your development time, development performance would be lower, longer. So no one argues with it. Everyone thinks it's, it's true. However, we meet it on daily projects, yeah? Who of you can tell that in your project the quality is really high? Anyone? Just one, one, two, three, four, all right. <laughs> right, so as I said, there is one Buenkite, yeah? Couple of guys, but all the others are really skeletons. But everyone knows this law. Why is that? Because there are changes. Changes that are happening, that are unavailable. And project is evolving only when those requirements change. And if requirements change, code must change. So the thing is that code must be well prepared to any changes to survive. So if you care about the, the quality, then the changes may become either at, at the same level or a bit easier, and velocity could stay as it is or grow slightly. But when we don't care about the code quality, situation can be only worse. The pens could be just, just slightly worse from over the time or could drop rapidly so that no more changes are possible. And Uncle Bob says, the higher the quality, the faster it go. The only way to go fast is to go well. 
All right, enough of that. Now I spoke about what needs to be done. You know that quality must be high. That's not negotiable, but how to do it? One way is to use fear, right? You can tell your team code as if the person that will be maintaining your code, will be reading your code, would be really violent murderer and psycho that would kill you if, if they know where you live. All right, so we can do it and even sometimes I see the code that is bad. Yeah, in my repository I see who wrote that? What the hell is that? And then I check the author and I see it's me, right? Me two years ago. Oh my gosh. And I know my address, I know where I live. What should I do now? So, doesn't matter if it's just your professionalism that is making you to write good quality code, or it's just a fear for the thing that we need to do is to code for future ourselves at least. We all like Venkat, and he also says about quality that it is inversely proportional to the effort that it takes to understand the code. So the easier the code is to understand, the higher the quality. So we see that readability is a must. How to measure it? Do you know any ways? Exactly, it's number of WTFs, that's very common unit in our industry. So if the code is great, if, you, if it's almost ideal, usually you'll hear just a couple of swears, yeah, here and there, nothing serious, just as stay as usual, right? But, but the, when the code is bad, there is much more of them happening. Do you think it's something, something bad, that's something that you should worry about if someone says, what the shit you wrote, what's that? I think we should worry and close ourselves and uh, do not write any code anymore. Actually, you know, the, the point of review is to be harsh, to be really sharp. And I see it on my example. My, my main experience connected with QA, with quality. And whenever I need to write the code, I know it will be a crap. When I write the code, I see lots of double TFs. What you did, guy? You so experienced QA that you know everything about co code quality and you scream on us when we give you a code, you cannot write anything. Yes, that's how it works. That's human nature. That to create readable code, natural process is to just, just do anything. Do not spend too much time, propose review, and discuss with others what is not readable. The only limitation during code review is to be professional. And whenever uh, I wrote the code and I give my code review for hours, I review our, their code. And at the end of the day, everyone codes is better and everyone could read it within the team. So what do we do on code review? For sure we should focus on things like hidden bugs, design, is it good for purpose? As I said, reading experience is so important. So if you see that you read it once and you don't understand it, don't limit yourself. Just said, I cannot understand it, please fix it. That's, that's the point of code review. You may try to find something positive uh, if, if it is. That's also nice practice, but I have a question for you. During the code review, should we focus on those? Code style, formatting, do you think it's, that's the point? You said sonar, right. 
So there are tools for that. So one could think, do not worry about it. Yeah, skip it totally. This is for tools. I won't be checking any of those. But I would say over otherwise. If you see there are issues with that during code review, you can scream. What do you did? What's that? But do not blame this guy. Blame rather your tools and process. Ask the question, why those things were not detected immediately, af within a couple of seconds after they were typed, and why they were not auto-fixed straight away, and now I need to deal with those during code review. That's definitely too light. So that's also the issue that we should address during code review and take action point. But before we spot those things, we need to agree on some style. And there are two st style guides available on the market. First one is Twitter's, which says more about interesting, uh, good practices that for, for, for the Java code uh, and some common bug patterns. And there is Google st style guide that is much more precise and explains uh, in deep detail how the sh code should be aligned and uh, what is prohibited and what is allowed. If you read this, those guides, uh, both of them, for example, mention that whenever we use those suffixes, and especially L, we should use capital letters. Why? Because depending on the font, uh, this could uh, be uh, read both as a number or as a uh, L, and we could just uh, do a mistake. And we don't know whether it's 1001 or 100 L. So usually, what should we do? We should use capitals there. And again, whenever something like that is visible on code review, that's definitely too late. Yeah, it, this should be fixed. If you type L, this should be done just straight away. One second and you fix it, you put upper. So there is, for example, inspection in check style that is called Apple L that you highlight your those. Also IntelliJ warns you about them. So you can use those tools to not let such things happening. Google style guide, for example, defines what is camel case. You could think, camel case? I know what is camel case. As a Java developer, I can read camel case faster than normal uh, sentences because I'm so accustomed to it. Yeah, even if uh, Mr. Tadeusz was written in camel case, I could read it with uh, pleasure and very fast. I know what is camel case exactly. But there are some current cases in camel case. Let's see it on IPv6 example. What is the correct form if there is a field name? For sure, uh, the first letter should be uh, lowercase because it's field, but on the other hand, it's ac acronym. So what, what's the correct form? Without strict definition, it's, it's hard to say. Similarly with iOS, if this class class name, should I put i to uppercase or what should I do? To, to define it and to, to make the decision, it's better to see it on those example. If we have class like XM, XML ID writer or HTTPS XML DB connection, what do you think is more readable? This one or this one? Second one is immediately more readable, yeah, because this all blends into the one word. So we see that generally whenever we have acronyms in names, what we do is we just capitalize the first letter and treat everything else lowercase. So we use them as, as normal words. And if we choose that definition of camel case, then all it becomes easy. 
there is just, just one way of doing things. So if you have class iOS, it should be like that. Here, it should be like that. So we lowercase everything else. Same with ID. Then I is capital, D is lowercase, and for example, this could be automated and, uh, and check with check style, abbreviation as word in name, and camel case becomes just easy and readable. I'm talking about this because I've seen so many different forms of camel case in my projects, um, and it could lead sometimes to bugs that we have, that there were two cli classes named in the same way but in different camel case style, um, and they were conflicting with each other on Windows, but on Linux not. Now, one more example from my code base we discovered recently. So what happened? Uh, we had a JVM with application running, and it became really, really slow. We couldn't connect with it with any visual VM. We couldn't take heap dump, uh, thread dump, anything, but JVM was running. Using some tools, we found that it is just native memory that is occupied in gigabytes, and swap is fully taken. So everything is running on the swap, that's why it is so slow and we couldn't do anything. Garbage collection is, is running all the time. So after a uh, few attempts, we, we managed to connect with one tool that, that uh, is just looking for resource leaks. And this tool led us to, to find this piece of code. This code was unnoticed by any static analysis rules that, that, we, that we had. Uh, probably you see the issue now, right? What happens here? There is a loop, there are several streams created, there is some native memory file handle allocated, but only one of them is closed. All the others remain uh, open and, and they, are, they are put on, on, on memory, right? So then we checked the configuration of the tools that we had. And we see uh, PMD was latest version, Spotbox was latest, everything fine. Mm, I think code review, no one spotted it. And we entered the IntelliJ IDR config because we got why it was not detected by this tool. So obvious mistake, right? And we checked the default IDEA settings and it appears that there is rule for that. If we enable it, it says it should be closed. This resource should be closed. But for some reason, it is not enabled by default. I don't know why it is not. And after some investigation, we, we found that there are 100 more rules that are available in IDEA. They are not enabled, but they could spot issues like that that could save us from serious trouble. So uh, on Wednesday, please go to this menu, to inspections, enable all of those for your code because they are so useful. A while ago, I mentioned spot bugs, right? But probably most of you uh, know rather find bugs. This is, this is the tool that we used a uh, long time ago, and it, is, it has some good reputation in the industry. But something bad happened with this project. Uh, there, is, there was one maintainer of find bugs, and about two years ago, he just disappeared. He lost interest to the project. People started to worry. He was just not responding to any messages, any emails. And he had uh, the administrator right over the, the repository. So unfortunately, this project became, became dead because of bus factor. He was the only developer. We don't know what happened with this guy. Probably it was not the bus, but this is the analogy that we use in our industry. Yeah, so what happens if the only developer was hit by a bus? 
um, and project couldn't continue. And we have example of it in the static analysis tools. This is the way how our management would understand this story. Yeah. Let, do not let it happen. So maximize number of people who could get hit by a bus and nothing happens. Right? So they hire, for example, architect, manager, QA manager, analyst, process champion. Right? If they get hit by a bus, nothing happens. Yeah, project continues. <laughs> really, is this the idea of bus factor? That the previous definition was wrong. Yeah, do not understand bus factor like that. Bus factor is a minimum number of developers who need to be hit by a bus so that the project is, is in a disarray. So this is minimum number of developers that are crucial to the project. So it's, it could be you, most probably, that you, you are uh, hiding some knowledge from the others. You, your code is not readable, not reviewed enough by, by the others, and you are this, this guy who, if disappear, the project cannot continue. Right, so ha have it that in mind, do not let it happen. That's why those sharing practices are so important here. Do not let find box history repeat again. Going back to our example, there are apparently other tools that if enabled, they will by default find issues like that immediately without any additional configuration. And after about one second, after typing such code, they could s spot the issue. And Sonoralint, uh, I use it as a plugin to IntelliJ. So when installed, it requires no configuration, it just runs. And on this code, it triggers immediately, says it is probably some uh, critical bug that will be going on here, please fix it. So it's a, just a matter of installing a plugin that do not uh, force you anything, but gives you just, just warnings uh, that most probably you run into trouble when you commit uh, this code. One more example. Releasing locks. So in my application, from time to time, we run into issues that mm, there is a deadlock. There are so many locks taken, they are not unlocked, and we now don't know uh, what is happening. And one of the example of such uh, such bug is, for example, conditional unlock. So we lock always, but do not always for some special paths, like exception or like if uh, we, we do unlock, but for the others not. So the interesting thing is that th this code is obviously buggy. Right, it shouldn't happen. But there are, again, not so many tools that could inform you immediately that it is wrong. Well, it should be detected in one second after typing. Mm. So uh, there is only just spot bugs that can find it. There is unreleased lock um, rule that if applied, it will uh, report it, but uh, no other tool by default. Even SonarInt cannot do it. Again, it appears that IntelliJ has inspection for it. It will warn you, but it's not enabled by default. So if enabled, it, it can stop it. One more thing that is uh, said by Twitter style guide is to use uh, you need variable names. Simple thing, but so many times I've seen uh, things like poll interval variable in the code, int file size. That, that's just everywhere. People code like that. And the simple, simple advice they give is just to put unit into the name, even shortcut. And immediately the code becomes clearer, yeah? If you put ms, GB, we know what is going on. We don't need to analyze uh, 
some documentation or some couple of classes before calling uh, and assigning these fields to understand what is going on. An even better solution they suggest is to use uh, a month class that is that is tuple on unit and and unit whether uh, whether we are measuring time or data or anything else then we don't need into the name but it is just built into the type and we could even perform some uh, conversions on it. Twitter also reminds us to be professional. So during code review, we must be professional, but also in the code, right? So very often I get personally angry on checked exceptions in Java, right? So you have most probably the same. Why they force us always to handle this IO exception? We know that every code, any code can throw exception, yeah? What's the point of highlighting this one exception specifically, right? So you could just blame the authors, uh, just wish them to burn in hell in the comments, just your angriness, put your angriness in the code, and I've seen similar examples that, that people do things like that, and what, and what they do is the, that they just, by this, losing this professionalism, they, they pollute uh, the code, they distract, but they, they, they don't see that actually those check exceptions, at least sometimes, they could be leveraged. So my approach to those is rather that. Okay, I know this is the design mistake in Java, there should not be checked exceptions, but whenever they are, what I try is to give more context, at least to, to improve situation a little bit. So instead of swearing, I try to put context because this our exception usually doesn't tell what exactly went wrong, what file was read. This is so bad uh, design and so bad exception handling that it says file could not be read, but we don't know which file. So though in this example, check exception could be used just, just to provide this additional contextual information. Then we could wrap it with any other exception that we want and we, we are done. No need to, to get, get angry at least on those. As I said, Google Java style has advantage of being very precise. It means that things written there could be automated. So we don't need to read it and apply manually. There are tools like Google Java Format plugin for IntelliJ, or there is XML file in Google Style Guild repository that you could attach to your config. And that's the only moment when you need to think about style. You just install this plugin, it is not configurable, it just runs for you, so every code you write, it gets reformatted according to all the rules they mention there are almost all, if only this could be uh, performed automatically. So, uh, nice, nice things to use if you agree exactly to this code style. However, my team uh, uses our own code style, a bit different from Google style. So we have our set of tools, but if you are starting and you, you like this style, you can apply it and, and go on. There is another tool from Google that actually we found really useful. It is called error prone. Do you know it? Do you use it? Not yet, so great that you are here because that's, that's interesting approach to the static analysis. So probably you know those tools like check style that runs mm, a separate phase. You need to uh, attach it to Maven or Gradle. You get some report and then, then you need to fix it, right? This tool, however, chooses, chooses approach just to integrate into compiler. So we say that this code compiles as Java or not if it has some issues. So it's kind of extension of concept of warnings in the compiler. 
okay, to, to, to detect them faster. Because usually what you do, if you code, you always need to compile. So one white run, some additional phase, if you can just perform those checks within the compilation using the same uh, trees in the memory, ASTs, so that you don't spend additional time on, on these analysis. One more advantage of this tool is that for, for many cases, it prints fixes. That exactly what, how this issue should be fixed. And this is a quiz for you. Do you see any issues within this code? All right, you were fast, what's wrong? They say here, I would be minus one. Fourth line, okay. But uh, okay, this is, this is kind of uh, intentional. Mm, actually, the expected here is 99. Naming is a problem. Yes, uh, one letter variable names are not uh, good enough usually. Yes, exactly. Exactly, so we are all here Java developers, but this is the quirk of Java that we don't see uh, or even don't know at all about its existence. That's so strange, I promise you. So whenever uh, we have short variable, we can add it to set, yeah? So there is item in the set that is uh, short, but any calculation performed on the short number Gives, gives integer. That's how Java is designed. So we cannot perform maps at all on short numbers. Even if it's addition or subtraction on small numbers, here would be zero minus one, should be minus one short, yes? Why not? But Java is designed in the way that it, gi it gives you minus one in int. Uh, and it tries to remove integer object from this set uh, while here we add uh, s short. So after running, it will print size of 100. Is the, but if this, if this code is corrected, and actually it's not easy to correct it because we cannot cast just one to short. We need to cast result of this subtraction to short and only then it would print size one. Which, which probably was intended by, by developer here. And error prone can spot issues like that. During compilation phase, Java compiler cannot do it, obviously. It, this code for Java is fine, fully fine, no warning at all. Error prone says that there is collection incompatible type. Um, it won't remove anything. You can read more about on this web page and this could save you from serious trouble. There is one more interesting tool that we found recently uh, that can help us to deal with those more minor issues. So the previous one was serious, but as I said on this broken window theory slide, even small things can make your code district to look worse and to uh, allow more serious crimes in the code. Yeah, so we should care also about minors, some formatting, so some style, just to improve your readability. But I think here that spending time on it is pointless. Yeah? So discussing it on contributes, pointless, waste of time. So the only reasonable thing to, to deal with formatting 
is to just cut those discussion, do not do it manually at all, just let machine do it all the time, right? So these tools is a plugin to Gradle that if applied, it analyzes all the, the files um, and it just compares the actual uh, file contents with the expected contents after applying some formatters. If it's uh, not all right, not according to, if it's not ma matching with the formatted one, it says there is a problem and it can automatically fix it. You just run spotless apply and all the issues are fixed. You just commit and, and continue. Right, so this is a piece of configuration uh, that, that you can use. So there are some formatting that could be applied to any file, uh, some markdown even, Gradle, whatever it can. It just says about indentation, tabs versus spaces war, some white trailing white spaces, and ending with new lines. But it also has some more advanced configs for uh, Kotlin format or Scala, Groovy, Java, also other non-JVM languages. Uh, if configured, it will say you whenever its code is not formatted properly, and it will fix it for you uh, with just running one command. There is one more thing that actually there should be no need to fix those things at all. They should be written correctly from the very beginning. So if you agree, let's say, to use spaces in uh, your projects instead of tabs, you should never spend a minute on changing it, right? Because that's, that's so obvious that it should be done that way. Uh, why to distract by stuff like that? So the thing we have is that in every repository we put editor config file. It's, it's a standard that many um, editors applied without any plugins. So those tools can understand such file and reconfigure themselves so that uh, those formatting options are used. So some char set that should be UTF, space indentation, for example, indentation size, final new line, trailing white space, you just, usually you configure it like that exactly, put that file to repo, and you don't need to worry about this stuff at all. All your projects, all your developers in all your teams will be reconfigured automatically to this, and you can cut this problem at all forever. One more thing, the dis discussion that, uh, or the thing that is causing us trouble is the new lines that, that we should have in our files, yeah? Some, some people say, okay, uh, it doesn't matter, right? It could be whatever, it's, it is so minor that do not discuss it at all. Some people say, uh, okay, on Linux should be just backslash n, on Windows rn. However, we chose approach for simplicity that in every repository, whatever it is checked out, we use just Unix line endings. Uh, to have the code look exactly the same on any platform, right? This was our decision made a couple of years ago. Let's keep it. Right, but now it's a, the thing, how to prevent any mistakes with it? How to automatically force anyone in the team, uh, reconfigure them to, to use that approach? So previously, until Git 10, when it, this was fixed, the solution to, to just enforce Aleph everywhere was to, to put that Git attribute in every repo. This was kind of bug uh, in Git and it, in, uh, 2016, it was fixed. So right now, you don't need to specify the files that are that should not be converted, right? Because what happens if we convert in JPEGs or jars Rn to N? File, files may get corrupted because they contain sometimes such sequences in the in the in the byte representation. So to not correct them, no more. Uh, 
this whitelist is needed, Git detects such binary files uh, automatically by text auto detection, and then you force anyone to use LF. So by having this file like that in every repo and making sure git 2.10 at least is used, which is two years old, which is a reasonable requirement, you again fix this problem permanently. And you don't run into issues that your code works on Unix and fails on Windows because there's, there's some mismatch in those line ending characters. Going further into the tools that could just auto fix uh, the issues and they could detect some sometimes really serious issues is a Gradle link. The static analysis for Gradle itself. So Gradle runs static analysis for, for the other code, but it could be verified uh, by itself. And generally detects misuse uh, mostly related to dependencies. So we detect some unused dependencies, uh, circular project dependencies when some projects depend on each other. Uh, it could detect excludes that are not used. They are not excluding anything. Mm, and also they try to format dependencies that are found in the project in a similar and uniform way. So short form, uh, no obsolete parentheses, and also uh, it can detect deprecated style of, of Gradle uh, configuration names. Uh, one more non-dependency related thing is that it could detect to old Gradle. So if, if it says that the Gradle is already uh, a few months old, it can report it to it asking you to upgrade. So if you're surprised, then Gradle indeed changed and deprecated compiled as compile and runtime configurations some time ago. Um, this was so popular because, for example, on Maven Central, when, when you download dependencies, they are still asking you to do compile. Well, this is considered as, as deprecated because it had major flow that I if dependency in library was marked as compile, then this dependency and all transitive dependencies of it, they were leaking into the class path of the consumers. So in my example, in my project, we have a library that we publish to several teams. And it appeared that um, after some, we discovered they're using a lot of our, a uh, lot of classes that are that were brought by some uh, transitive dependencies of our library that should never um, just leak, yeah? because we were using some, let's say, um, common slang library in version 3.3. We updated it to 3.7, and and it's something broke in their code, right? Because they were depending on it, or we removed that library and they're screaming, "Why do you no longer not provide common slang? We were relying on it." Yeah, why relying on our internal transitive dependency it doesn't make sense. So to prevent such issues, they now split it into API and implementation uh, dependency. So if something we want to expose so that others can use uh, this library, it's API. But whenever it is our implementation detail that we use some Guava commons or whatever, just for this module purposes, it's just implementation and this should be default dependency scope in your project. So it also reduces recompilations, makes compilation faster, um, and we should migrate to those. And this tool can do it automatically. So what do you think? What's wrong with such dependency declaration in Gradle? So for sure there is some exclude that is um, unused because Guava doesn't depend on those. There are some parentheses. There is this long form that could be replaced with short. So this tool can, can fix and automatically, by running this command, 
fix those into those. So we, right now it's using implementation, using short form, no unnecessary excludes, so I really recommend it. All right, one more thing, ideal developer. What could we hire? These guys on the left or on the right? On the previous talk, I was, yeah, there was some ninja developer mentioned, some uh, hacker, some rockstar. So what do you think would be better for us? Companies try to hire people on the right, but I would say that better principle can, can give us some hint what is the correct approach. But complexity in the project increases rapidly until it reaches the level where when no one else can understand what is going on. So whenever you have a people that could understand very complex stuff, the complexity of a project will be higher. Yeah, so if you, have, if you want to have simple project, then try to hire people that would rather scream when they hear something is complex. Yeah, that would tell you, please simplify it instead of hacking solutions and making complex thing to work. So Trisha G says that if you hire those ninjas and rock stars, what you end up in the project is just broken guitars and dead bodies, right? So do not go that way because you, you may go into that skeletal way. So simplicity is the ultimate sophistication of the project and I've, everything I spoke before is important but this is the most important one. So create simple understandable stuff that, 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 is, that is just, just readable. So to summarize, code reviews, uh, of course, they are very important. Choose some style guide, create your own or apply existing one. Mm, it simplifies and cuts some discussions. Use all the tools that I mentioned, not just one or two, because I've showed the examples that only one of, of those several tools were able to detect really sh serious issues that you never want to have. So in my project, we apply all of those. You can go the similar way. I'm not saying it's, it's just easy and convenient to spend some time, but it gives some benefits. Do not repeat history as fine bugs and go with this extended keys principle, which says to keep everything straightforward, short, small, stupid, simple for silly guys. So we don't want to improve the quality by just testing. There are much more code practices that needs to be applied as we don't just wait ourselves to uh, lose our weight. So it needs to be deeply baked in into the, the Java code with the tools. So now let, is the time to reveal this ultimate elite I talk about. So there are many of those low level practices that needs to be applied that convert into higher level qualities of the code, like analyzability, modifiability, testability, reusability, modularity, that we need to apply. And my presentation only was about tiny fraction of those. This topic is really broad, but they all boil down into maintainability. So this is the thing that which we should focus on while developing. Do all the stuff so it is made and able in the future for future us. So thank you very much for being with me and I wish you green project life. Thank you.